You may have heard that my new book is coming out this Tuesday. Sadly, I didn't get invited on The View to talk about it. <laughs> Would have helped. Would have helped. But I did get invited on a much better show. I can honestly say it may be my favorite interview ever. They even gave me permission to run the full clip here on my very own show. Take a look. Well, thank you for having me. Um, I've always been a fan of your investigative work, so it's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> well, I really did this for the fans. Uh, everywhere I go, people ask me, where can they read the monologues from the show? Is there one place where they can go and get them? So I decided, why not get the very best monologues and put them in the book? <laughs> You know what I thought? I figured, wouldn't it be different to take a book of your writing and criticize it and take it apart and, and, and go after the things that you got wrong? Because no one's ever done that. So I took my monologues. And then if you look into the book, uh, you'll see, take a look, that I have commentary with my actual monologues, uh, which I'm, and I'm fairly blunt about the things I got wrong. <laughs> Well, you know what? The one thing I noticed is that I tend to rely on certain cliches. Like if I'm writing about a liberal, I will often rely on, I'll say that they've got a nose ring or they've got a henna tattoo. And it's just like, it's, I, I find that I fall into stereotypes over time, which is intellectually lazy. So I try to call myself on that wherever I go. Also, I think I was a little too mean on Bernie Sanders. Uh, I should have been nicer. <laughs> I think that my favorite topic is always going to be Hollywood because it's so easy. Uh, something is always going on in that place that uh, that is worthy of ridicule. Every day there's a an actor or an actress saying something stupid, and I wake up every morning to write about it. It makes my job so easy. It does. <laughs> Well, generally, you know, the producer will send me some ideas. And that's a, actually a great question, um, Dolphin. And, uh, and what I do is I just pick the ones that are more, most exciting to me. And then I start writing. I don't like to think about it too much because if you think about it, you, 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 uh, you start to lose the steam. You want to just dive right in. And then before you know it, you come up with your own point of view. It's really, it's really a lot of fun, I think. You should try it. Well, I learned that uh, uh, there are a lot of interesting topics that culminated in Trump's presidency. If you look at the things that I covered, law and order, identity politics, um, uh, terrorism, these were all the things that Donald Trump kind of hit on. So I'm convinced that he created his entire political plank on my monologues or off my monologues. Yes. <laughs> I think the shorter, the better, much like me. The, uh, if you can't, you got to, if, if, if you can make it under 80 seconds, that's perfect. It should be sharp, original, and funny. It doesn't have to be funny off the bat. You first, you write it, and then you add the jokes later. But the whole key is to make it short, clear, concise, and unexpected and surprising, much like the work you do, Dolphin. <laughs> Thanks again to uh, Dolphin Stevens and Ted Frogerson. Don't forget, next weekend is the start of my book tour. I'll be in Fort Worth and Dallas on Saturday, then the Woodlands, Texas 
on Sunday, August 5th. More dates coming soon. Go to ggutfeld.com for the latest tour information. Don't go anywhere. Final thoughts next. <laughs> Jamie, where are you going to be? Uh, I actually am going to be on Netflix. If you guys have Netflix, you can check out season two of my TV show with Rob Schneider. Uh, it's called Real Rob. It's on Netflix right now. It's very, very funny. I enjoy it immensely, and I mean that even though I haven't seen it. No, I'm kidding. I watch it. I watch it all the time. Nick, you got a movie. Gosnell opens October 12th in 750 theaters nationwide, and here's a clip. A lot of the employees at that clinic have been arrested on drug trafficking charges. Why haven't you? Objection! Isn't it true that you made a deal with the DA to avoid prosecution? Objection! Given your personal animosity for Dr. Gosnell, why should we believe anything Your you Honor. have to say? Wow, that's like really intense. Wow. I love that guy. He's a great actor. <laughs> he is a great <laughs> actor. A tremendous movie. All right. Thank you, Jamie, Nick, Catherine, Tyrus, Dolphin Stevens, Ted Flowers, Studio Audience. The Trump legal team ramping up its attacks on President Trump's former personal attorney, suggesting Michael Cohen's secretly recorded conversation with the president was tampered with. Good evening, I'm John Scott. This is the Fox Report. Rudy Giuliani demands to see the original tape of Cohen and then-candidate Trump as they apparently discussed buying the story of a former Playboy model who claims she had an affair with Mr. Trump. Giuliani telling Chris Wallace on Fox News Sunday that Cohen has zero credibility and adding this. The president feels disappointed. I think the anger is over. Uh, you know, we've, we've assured him in a very strange way this is a very good development for us because we do have all these tapes and these tapes are completely demonstrate the president did nothing wrong. Meanwhile, some of the president's fiercest allies in Congress are looking to dial up the pressure on the FBI as they press for more information on the wiretapping of a former Trump campaign advisor. We have Fox team coverage on this. Garrett Tenney is in Washington, but we begin with Allison Barber in Berkeley Heights, New Jersey, near the president's golf club, where he's wrapping up the weekend. Allison, let's start with the Trump Cohen tape. What makes Mr. Giuliani think it's been tampered with? Well, he says that the tape ends abruptly and that forensic experts he had look at the tape say that they can tell that it's been played with in some form or fashion. Played is the word that Mr. Giuliani used when we spoke to him yesterday. But beyond that, Giuliani has not offered specific evidence as to what makes him think the recording was tampered with. Giuliani told Fox News that he had the Trump Cohen recording analyzed by two forensic experts and some retired FBI agents who he's worked with in the past. According to Mr. Giuliani, they came back to him and said it is a tape of a tape and they could not say if the tape ends abruptly because Mr. Cohen turned it off in real time or if something happened to it after the fact. Giuliani says the Trump legal team did not leak the Cohen Trump tape but when I spoke to him on the phone yesterday Giuliani said there are more recordings and that he wants them released. On CBS Face the Nation Giuliani said there are over 180 recordings of Cohen and others. One of those with the president of the United States. That's the three minute one involving, um, involving the uh, McDougal payment, let's call AMI McDougal payment. There are 12 others, maybe 11 or 12 others, out of the 183, in which the president is discussed in, at any length by Cohen, mostly with reporters, all uh, clearly corroborating what the president has said. Giuliani is using those other tapes to push back on the allegation or in at various reports, the allegation that Cohen is perhaps going to tell special counsel Robert Mueller that President Trump knew about that 2016 meeting in Trump Tower with Russian officials, a claim Trump, of course, has denied. Giuliani says if that were the case, something would be in these tapes because in his view, Cohen seems to have recorded almost everything. John. So Michael Cohen is an attorney. He also has an attorney. Um, what's that attorney saying about all of this? He says that Giuliani is confused. In a statement, Lanny Davis, Cohen's attorney, seemingly focused on reports that Giuliani warned Cohen to stop talking and Giuliani's assertion that Cohen is violating attorney-client privileges. Davis said, quote, 
Mr. Giuliani seems to be confused. He expressly waived attorney-client privilege last week and repeatedly and inaccurately, as proven by the tape, talked and talked about the recording forfeiting all confidentiality claims. Now, I asked Mr. Davis if he would do a phone interview with us this morning. He said, John, that he could not comment beyond that statement. John? Allison Barber in New Jersey, where the president is spending the weekend. Allison, thanks. Meantime, President Trump also facing mounting pressure from Capitol Hill. House Republicans are calling on him to declassify key parts of the secret documents used to justify government surveillance of his campaign and former campaign. Uh, former campaign aide, I should say, Carter Page. This, as the House Intelligence Committee looks into whether the FBI sent informants to gather dirt on President Trump and his campaign before it authorized the investigation into possible Russian collusion. Garrett Tenney in our D.C. Bureau has more on all of this. Garrett. Well, John, congressional investigators want to know how many informants the FBI used, when they were hired, and how much they were paid. This week, House Republicans again threatened to hold Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein in contempt for allegedly failing to provide them with all of the documents and witness interviews that they've requested. Members of the House Intelligence Committee are also asking President Trump to declassify portions of the FBI's request to surveil former Trump campaign advisor Carter Page. Last week, the FBI released four hundred pages of heavily redacted documents related to its warrant applications, showing the Bureau relied heavily on the so-called Trump dossier to justify its request, despite it being an unverified piece of Democratic opposition research. Chairman Devin Nunes claims the 20 pages he wants declassified show additional wrongdoing by the FBI and Justice Department. And on Sunday Morning Futures, Nunes accused those agencies of intentionally slow walking in hopes that Democrats will retake the House in the fall and shut down this investigation. We are quite confident that once the American people see these 20 pages, uh, at least for those that will get real reporting on this issue, they will be shocked by what's in that FISA application. That's why the sooner the president declassifies this, the better. And I think the American people need to understand how important it's going to be to get out and vote in this election. The White House says that at least for now, President Trump does not plan to get involved in this request to declassify additional documents. But according to Devin Nunes, that could change because his understanding is that White House lawyers are looking into this issue to see if they can declassify those documents sooner rather than later. John? Garrett Tinney in Washington. Thanks. You got it. For more on all this, let's bring in Amber Athey, media and breaking news editor for The Daily Caller. So Republicans at least suspect that the FBI was essentially spying on the campaign or, or looking for dirt on the campaign before they had any interest in, in Russian election meddling? Yeah, that's the allegation here. And I think the lawmakers are really trying to put pressure on Trump to declassify these documents so they can see exactly what was going on even before the Russian meddling claims. Um, but really, when you look at this uh, FISA warrant against Carter Page, it really lays a uh, claim to everything that Nunes said in his memo, which was that not only did they rely heavily on this steel dossier that was unverified and paid for by the DNC, but they also didn't disclose that the DNC was the one paying for it. In that warrant, they said that Trump was named as candidate number one, but instead of ever saying that candidate number two or political party number two was paying for that dossier, they insisted that Steele couldn't have been biased because he was never told that he was supposed to be, which we know isn't true because he admitted to Bruce Orr that he actually hated Trump and never wanted to see him in office. So really, Republicans are trying to put the pressure on here to prove all of their claims all along, which is that the Russian investigation into Trump and uh, all of the investigations are, are just basically a ploy to try to take out a sitting president. And, and re Republicans are saying that the FISA court judges did not get the full picture of the Steele dossier and, and where it came from, how it was paid for, and the political bias behind it. You're exactly right. Like I said, Trump was named as candidate number one in that FISA application. However, there was no mention that candidate number two or political party number two, a.k.a. Hillary Clinton and the DNC would have been the ones instructing Steele to create that dossier or, or paying for him to create it. So the FISA court was not aware that 
this was a political opposition document. And what's really interesting, too, is that Democrats are trying to say, well, you can tell from the application that the DNC was paying for it uh, because of the way that Fusion GPS was mentioned, which is absolutely ridiculous. If you read through the claims, it's pretty clear um, that they made every effort to say that this was not a biased investigation or, right. or a biased document. They also said that Fusion GPS had, had proven reliable and, and right. uh, that they had, had used them in background investigations in the past. Democrats also like to say that, look, uh, the, a number of the judges on this FISA court who approved these warrants had been appointed by Republican presidents. But if they're getting bad information or inaccurate information or not the complete picture, um, it can lead to incomplete conclusions and rulings from the bench. Right. That's a completely bad faith argument. If the people on the FISA court are not aware of all the information required to make an informed decision about whether or not to grant a FISA warrant, then they can't really be held accountable for that decision. Um, and now Republicans are putting the pressure on Rod Rosenstein, um, some even introducing articles of impeachment, saying that on top of failing to provide documents that the House has requested, he also was signing off on some of the FISA warrants against Carter Page. And so where are his involvements in this whole deal. And uh, really, it's not, um, those Republicans are going to have a hard time getting that through, especially in the Senate, but it will provide some political cover if Trump decides to take action against Rod Rosenstein. Real quickly, I want to play something that uh, Senator Lindsey Graham had to say about Michael Cohen, the president's former attorney who seems to have changed sides. Listen. I've never seen a lawyer behave this way in my entire life, and I've been a lawyer my, most of my adult life. When it comes to Michael Cohen, you should be very suspicious of anything he says. And this idea that he told Trump about the Russian meeting before it happened is, to us, very much new news. So, Mr. Cohen, if you got something new to say, you need to come to Congress and say it under oath. Because that uh, is a story that apparently he has not offered to Capitol Hill, Amber. Not to mention, as the president noted in a tweet this morning, he was praising Donald Trump Jr.'s honesty during that meeting uh, just back when it happened. And now he's quickly changed his tune. I think Lindsey Graham is right to say that we should be suspicious of Michael Cohen for someone who is probably the most loyal person to the president to turn around and say that he was secretly recording his client, which it's probably not illegal, but it's certainly a very scummy thing to do. Mm. Uh, we should definitely be questioning his credibility and wondering why he's changing his tune now that he's under his own legal problems. Amber Athey is with The Daily Caller. Amber, thank you. You'll be back uh, in just a bit to discuss the challenges facing both Republicans and Democrats ahead of the November midterms. Well, Fox News alert now. We have just learned that a sixth person has been killed in the car fire burning in Northern California. That fire already destroying hundreds of homes near Redding. It's one of 17 fires burning up and down that state. In Southern California, crews are starting to get a handle on the Cranston fire east of Los Angeles. And take a look at this new video of the car fire in the north jumping over the Sacramento River. A Cal Fire Division chief urging everyone to take evacuation orders there seriously. We're having large damaging fires more often than not um, now. So when there is a fire in the area, if you have any concerns, get out early, even before there's evacuation orders. Uh, but especially when there's advisory or mandatory evacuations, we need people to go, um, have their stuff ready, have a place to go, and get out early. Jonathan Hunt is in Riverside County near the Cranston Fire. What's the latest there, Jonathan? Well, some good news here today, John. It just does seem that firefighters are very much getting the upper hand here on the Cranston Fire. But this is the kind of landscape these fires leave behind. As you look across the hillside here from these charred trees, you can just see part of the 13,000 acres that were scorched by the Cranston Fire. 1,200 firefighters involved in the operation to beat back this blaze, along with 15 water dropping helicopters, 10 fixed wing aircraft, and they now have something like a third of this fire contained. In other words, they have got a scratch line around it. They believe they will have it fully contained within the next 10 days. The good news here is that not a single home that we are aware of was actually torched, and that is very much thanks to the efforts of those firefighters. Many of them were leaving the command center to today, John, and head
heading out. That is a sure sign that they think they have won this particular battle, for now at least. John? So they've won that one in Southern California, but it's a very different story up north. Yeah, very different story up north. The car fire continues to rage pretty much entirely out of control. I talked about containment down here being at around 30%. It's just 5% up at the car fire. Uh, something like 139 square miles have been torched there. To put that in some perspective, that's about the size of the city of Detroit. More than 500 buildings have burned. According to an account by the Associated Press, some 300 of those were people's homes and 38,000 people have been evacuated. A terrifying situation for them. Listen here. This fire is, has no mercy. It's just everywhere. The flames were just one, not even one block down here, swirling and noise, wind blowing. I mean, it was just nothing I've ever heard in California. And the car fire, far from the only one up in Northern California, the famous wine region of Napa Valley, dealing with a fire there. There's also one near Yosemite National Park and a very tough fire being fought right now in Mendocino County uh, up in Northern California. John, the, the big concern here is the sheer exhaustion that is bound to set in among the state's thousands of heroic firefighters. And to emphasize that, John, we we are only just at the very beginning of fire season. John? Jonathan Hunt in California. Jonathan, thank you. Well, we've told you President Trump spent the weekend in New Jersey at his golf resort there, Trump National. Uh, he is now at the Morristown Airport. You can see him striding toward Air Force One. This is, again, the smaller version of Air Force One, not the big 747. Uh, because of the shorter runway at Morristown and the shorter trip involved, uh, they put the president on a 757, and it is still called Air Force One. Anytime the president is boarding it, uh, is on board, uh, it gets that designation with air traffic control. So the president will fly back to D.C. It'll be a quick trip and back to the Oval Office and work. In the meantime, the president suggested that he is prepared to go to the mat on immigration reform what he's threatening, and why it could have a big impact on the midterms. And a sanctuary city escalating its feud with the White House, announcing the end of a decade-long contract with ICE. How the administration is responding. Plus, the White House hanging its hat on the new GDP number, but is this kind of growth sustainable? It's a great day for America. This 4.1% quarter, and a year that's on track for more than 3% growth is a testament to the president's leadership and his vision for this economy.